In our first lecture, we'll talk about what microbes are. Microbes are the most numerous and diverse organisms on Earth. There are almost 10 orders of magnitude more microbial cells on Earth than there are stars in the universe. The majority of the Earth's biomass, the total mass of living things, is microbial. But microbes are not just germs that make us sick. They also perform many jobs that help us. But what are microbes exactly? The term microbe really has no scientific meaning. Microbes are just organisms that are too small to be seen with the naked eye. They are single-celled and can be classified as bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes, and viruses. All living things, not just microbes, can be classified into three of these groups, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Organisms in each of these groups share characteristics and functions. To begin with, both bacteria and archaea are simple compared to eukaryotes. They are single-celled organisms, and while the cells that make up our bodies have a separate compartment called a nucleus where our DNA is stored, bacterial and archaeal DNA is not stored in a nucleus. What distinguish bacteria and archaea from each other are the types of things that they can do. The third group of microbes, eukaryotes, contain microbes that are more complex. They do have their DNA contained in a nucleus, just like our human cells. Although our cells are eukaryotic, so are many microbes. Viruses, the last category of microbes, do not fall into one of these three major categories of life. They are actually on the border of what we consider to be living. Viruses are made up only of genetic material, DNA and RNA, inside a protein coat. They are completely inactive until they come into contact with a host. Then they spring into action, injecting their genetic material into the host. Now let's talk about each of these groups of microbes briefly. Bacteria generally come in three main shapes. Bacilli, which are rods, as seen in the middle. Cocci, which are balls, which you can see on the right. And spirals, which are pictured on the left. These shapes may help different bacteria perform different functions. But in many cases, bacteria that look similar can do different things. It might be impossible to distinguish a bacteria that can make us sick from a bacteria that creates vitamins or other helpful compounds just by looking. Many bacteria are solitary, but some cluster in groups, creating formations like colonies or films. When you wake up in the morning and have a bad taste or a slimy feeling in your mouth, it's the result of a bacterial film that has formed overnight. A good reminder to brush your teeth. Archaea look very similar to bacteria. In fact, for a long time, we thought they were bacteria until we looked at their DNA. Like bacteria, archaea do not have a nucleus and come in a limited number of shapes. They also use cilia and flagella to move. However, differences in their DNA compared to bacteria mean that they can perform different functions than bacteria. Many archaea live in extreme environments and can use unique compounds such as sulfur for food. For example, methanogens live deep in the digestive tract of many mammals and produce methane as waste when they make energy. Halophiles are archaea that live in salty environments like salt flats. These places are saltier than seawater. Seawater is approximately 0.9% salt, but halophiles can tolerate up to 9% salt. Thermophiles are archaea that live in extremely hot temperatures, above boiling temperature, such as hot springs and deep sea vents. Finally, psychrophiles are archaea that live in extremely cold temperatures, below freezing point, such as glaciers. In addition to these extreme environments, many archaea can also be found in what we would consider more normal environments, like soil and seawater. In general, bacteria, and to a lesser extent archaea, dominate the guts of most living organisms. However, there are almost always a few eukaryotic microbes as well. One of the major groups of microbial eukaryotes is fungi. As you may be aware, not all fungi are microbial. Fungi can be small and single-celled, but also big and multi-celled. For example, yeast, pictured on the top, is a single-celled fungus that we consider a microbe, while a three-and-a-half-mile-wide mushroom consisting of many interconnected fungal cells exists in Oregon. Most fungi decompose organic material. Specifically, they excrete chemicals called enzymes, like the chemicals in our stomach, onto organic matter like wood to break it down and then absorb the nutrients through their cells. Fungi, like bacteria and archaea, can also produce compounds that are useful to humans. For example, Ashbiaga sepi is a source of vitamins such as riboflavin, and Aspergillus niger, pictured on the bottom right, 
makes enzymes used in products like laundry detergent. Other fungi can have negative effects. Aspergillus flavus produces a poison called aflatoxin on peanuts and other crops that can make people who eat these foods sick. And Phytophthora infestans, pictured on the bottom left, caused the Great Potato Famine in Ireland in the mid-1800s. Unlike bacteria and archaea, most fungal cells are static and can't move far on their own. However, fungi can spread their cells using spores, tiny capsules that act like seeds, or hyphae, tiny projections that act like roots or stems. In addition to fungi, other microbial eukaryotes also exist. Many of these are called protozoa and include organisms such as primitive algae on the bottom left, amoebas on the top, and slime molds on the bottom right. Viruses are also considered microbes, but they're very different. For one, they are tiny, much smaller than even archaea and bacteria. Another difference between other microbes and viruses is that other microbes can reproduce by themselves, but viruses need to infect a cell to reproduce. Here you can see the deadly Ebola virus infecting a cell on the left, and the common flu virus on the right. Remember that different viruses have different hosts. For example, a virus that infects a fish may have no effect on humans. However, we know based on recent epidemics of viruses like bird flu and swine flu that viruses can evolve rapidly to infect new hosts. As we've hinted, microbes perform many helpful functions. They can produce compounds such as vitamins and enzymes that we use in health and industry. However, they also have a variety of environmental functions. For instance, microbes are responsible for cycling many nutrients in our environment. They play an important role in the carbon cycle. When dead leaves fall off of trees, who do you think decomposes the leaves and releases nutrients back into the soil? Microbes. Microbes are also critical to the nitrogen cycle, which allows plants to grow and powers our farms. Bacteria are the only organisms that can take nitrogen from the air and convert it into a form that is usable by plants in the soil. Having these types of bacteria in the soil means we need less fertilizer. In fact, we really only need fertilizer when we've grown crops on the same soil for so long that we've depleted the nutrients and the microbes that help provide those nutrients. Microbes also play an important role in cleaning wastewater. They can take organic material and chemicals out of the water that would be toxic to humans and use them to make other non-toxic substances, leaving the water cleaner than it began. We also use microbes to clean up other human messes. I'm sure a lot of us have heard about the oil-eating bacteria that we commonly use to try to clean up oil spills in oceans and other bodies of water. Oil spills do a lot of damage to the environment, but without these bacteria, they would do even more. Of course, microbes have many functions in the human body as well. That's what this course is about. We'll start to talk about those with Rob in the next lecture. But first, we're going to hear from Jack Gilbert and Valerie McKenzie about their work with microbes outside the human body. <laughs>